Welcome to this introductory lesson, or rather uh, an introductory mini lecture dedicated to Chopin, 24 Preludes, Opus 28. Following the link in the description, you can find a comprehensive course where I speak in detail about each prelude, covering topics like te te technique optimization, learning strategies, uh, interpretational options, fingering, pedaling, and many, many other uh, useful topic. So if you're uh, considering or if you're working on this set, uh, you might find a lot of useful information there. And for those of you who are new on this channel, I would like to remind you that I also do teach online. So if you guys are interested in a personalized approach, if you are interested to study with me, uh, just contact me following the link in the description. As I feel it uh, in my experience and in, in my opinion, many people uh, in our modern society, they feel quite uh, uncomfortable to reflect and to speak about topics like pain, loss, death, sense of life and uh, things like that, that uh, become rather a taboo in our um, ratio-oriented society of healthy diets and, uh, and stuff. But uh, in my opinion, uh, this cycle, as well as many other Chopin works, are packed with such ideas. And in general, it was quite common for uh, romantic composers, uh, for even classical composers like Beethoven, to um, philosophize within their music, reflecting about such uh, eternal topics. That's why um, if we would look at this cycle and we would just look at the, the very first uh, few preludes, we might notice that Chopin doesn't really care about our comfort zone. Uh, because is, as we know, each prelude features a special character. They are very contrast in nature. And from the very beginning, ten Chopin tends to make powerful contrasts. Uh, so, for example, the very first prelude is one of the most positive pieces he, have, he has ever composed. And uh, when I play it, I immediately feel myself. Uh, I remember myself being 16 years old when I had still a lot of energy and I didn't have to drink a gallon of coffee and to make regular uh, physical exercises in order to uh, stay in shape. And this feeling that the whole life is in front of you, awaits for you to come and enjoy its gift. Mm -hmm. We'll be speaking about efficiency and about interpretational options because there are quite a few different options how we could play this piece. But anyway, we I think we can we all can agree that this is a very positive, very hopeful piece. I would describe it as a joyful anticipation of something great, of something uh, amazing that is inevitably is going to happen with you. Um, and after that. Uh, the second prelude that uh, that contains this Dies Irae motif that, as we know, symbolizes death, pain, suffering since a uh, long time. So this is one of the most um, important uh, topics in music, this motif, actually. And immediately we get into the into a space of uh, slow dying of fate of suffering and this melody uh, that is so uh, sad and so uh, pathetic in a way, but extremely tragic. Uh, this melody sounds like, well, there is nothing that can be done. And uh, that's why this prelude, after the first one on this contrast, feels uh, so, so depressive, actually. And then another pair, another very strong contraposition of prelude number three that is very, again, very positive. And some people compare it to spring streams when nature revives during the spring, and this is a very nice uh, comparison. <laughs> Of 
course, uh, we will be speaking about uh, efficiency, about how to shape these motions and how to reach um, tension-free release. But one of the most important things, of course, is to avoid lifting mm. fingers very high when you play because then you need more time to press a new key and that leads to enormous amount of tension. So at first, uh, guys, if you work on this piece, uh, first of all, make sure that you release fingers after the hit instead of lifting them. So, so being very close to the keys. And uh, at first I would uh, practice this piece uh, rather in a rather moderate tempo on mezzo forte, seeking for comfort in, in the hand and then gradually enlightening, uh, playing it lighter and lighter and uh, faster and faster. And prelude number four would feature a quite strong contrast again. So if number three, prelude number three would be a spring mood, then number four would be rather an autumn mood. And I don't know how about you, but I always feel very sad and very quite depressed during the autumn. I don't really like autumn because everything is so gray. And uh, some people really love autumn for its bright colors and stuff, but I find it uh, very depressing. So this contrast between three and four, uh, prelude three and four, it's uh, again, it's very, very strong. And then number five, that uh, uh, of course quite challenging. Um, and there are also different options how to interpret this piece. And we'll be speaking about um, coordination of motions uh, in prelude number five. But overall, this is a very uh, joyful piece. While number six again is quite, uh, quite uh, depressive again. So these first six preludes, they uh, represent pairs of polar emotions, very, very opposite ones. Uh, then these contrasts, they soften a bit, they become less uh, drastic, I would say. And I really, I would suggest you to look at the um, informal uh, titles of these preludes uh, given by uh, Bulov and Corto. Uh, these titles um, you can find in the um, Wikipedia article uh, about these preludes because both Bulov and Corto they have named each prelude, they have um, created uh, a name for each prelude, characterizing it. And it's very interesting to compare them because sometimes they are very close and sometimes they are very different. And uh, most, uh, most of all I like uh, the contrast of their opinions about prelude number 15. Uh, because Bulov calls it, as we know it mostly, raindrop, while uh, Alfred Corteau um, calls it, um, creates a title for it, but death is here in the shadows. And again, I know that for many people it would be too much, too darkish, and um, they would say, no, no, it's just a nice music, why would you dramatize? But uh, I would say that this is one of the most tragic preludes in the set, because if you listen to this music um, just out of the blue, you might think, oh, that's a nice music. It's so beautiful. want to play it in a, such a you know um, light lightly melancholic a rather sentimental manner but if you know what comes next uh, in the middle of that prelude something archaic something very uh, dark a uh, fate something that can't be changed and something so evil that it causes a huge dramatic explosion later on <laughs> explosion it's so painful that after that we have a reaction we have so 
So this part, uh, this uh, second part of the climax, it's already a personal reaction on what has happened before. And uh, this makes this music extremely tragic. And each time I play it, uh, this prelude, I uh, somehow it hits very deeply in me. And uh, I have really big time um, emotionally when I play it. That's why I think that uh, actually the description of Corto is uh, a bit more profound. But um, the very fact that uh, Bulov's version raindrop is way more famous in my opinion it also characterizes our society quite a bit because it seems that we prefer lightly sentimental stuff uh, rather than uh, profound um, topics the problem is that if you treat uh, this piece uh, from the rather um, corto positions then it becomes such a powerful uh, such a devastatingly dramatic, tragic piece, I would say, that um, playing prelude number 16 after this one is quite tricky because um, playing, uh, in my personal experience, playing prelude number 16 on its own, it's not a big deal if you have optimized uh, your technique and we will be speaking about that a lot you know, during the course. But playing it after number 15, it's quite difficult because you have to get yourself out of that limbo, out of that um, shroud where you fall, uh, where you dive during uh, prelude number 15. So what happens here in the in a uh, raindrop prelude is actually this raindrop from the beginning. It turns into an uh, abatement bell, funeral bell in the middle of the piece. And that's why um, after this um, quite dramatic, quite tragic experience, when we feel uh, this fragility of beauty that is so easily destroyed um, in the middle section, prelude number 16 becomes rather necessary because it helps us to um, get out of that limbo, get out of that shroud where we fall during uh, prelude number 15. And in my opinion, this pair, preludes number 15, 16, it's not a coincidence that they are placed at the golden point of the cycle after two thirds of the cycle precisely. Uh, because in my opinion, this is the dramatic, than dramatic center of the cycle. And uh, in my opinion, we have to perceive them together again like another pair of preludes and of course i will be dedicating a special quite uh, detailed lesson to this prelude and we'll be speaking a lot about um learning uh, strategies and technique optimization but just one thing i want to make you aware of is that it makes a huge difference whether you play this prelude with um, curved fingers or with flattened fingers the reason for that is um, you, you can experiment actually on the keyboard. Just place your hand and make an intended curl. Curl your fingers really well. And then quickly move your second finger like that. You might notice uh, quite shortly, quite soon, that this movement becomes kind of uncomfortable, that you are getting a bit stuck, that it, it needs some effort. And then Flatten your fingers and do same movement, same movement. Quickly moving your second finger and you will notice uh, how easier it is to move your finger like that. And um, this is the reason why intended curl is not uh, really beneficial for piano playing when we have to play um, extremely fast. And if you would watch some finest players, like for example, uh, Marta Argerich is one of the bri brightest examples of uh, this technique, of this natural, efficient piano technique. If you would watch her hands, you might notice uh, how flattened are her fingers most of the time and how quickly she's able to move uh, her second finger, especially. And it feels very light and very natural. And 
exactly because it's flattened, because if it would be curled, she wouldn't be able to play that efficiently. So this is one tip for you to consider when you will be um, working on that piece. Of course, another danger is that if you would play this prelude with uh, flattened fingers uh, without enough stability in the knuckles and nail joint, then of course um, your uh, fingers would sound rather as overcooked uh, spaghetti which uh, would not uh, would not be convinc uh, convincing anyway. So uh, I would suggest you to start working on it with uh, strong fingers and gaining stability in each finger, making sure that you have uh, enough stability in the nail joint, in the knuckles, and of course, free uh, released wrist. Again, of course, avoiding any kind of lifting fingers high, because this is exactly what causes overuse issues. But then, as more confident you will become, with this piece, as more uh, as more you can allow yourself to flatten the fingers, and you will notice how uh, comfortable it is to play uh, when your fingers is flattened, because you can roll through position much faster. There are also a few uh, wide compositional arches within this uh, cycle. Uh, the biggest one is like a rainbow that connects number one and number two. 24 because again these preludes they are of course are very different the last prelude is probably w the most dramatic one this prelude ends again uh, with a rather funeral bell so it's not exactly very joyful or sentimental <laughs> and a funny story i had uh, recently when i was playing this um to my friend and uh, he, he asked me um, are you not afraid to play that last note and I asked him like no why it's just one note and he told me like well you know I know so many people miss that last bass and uh, he told me that he saw some pianists that are actually before um, hitting that D while playing that passage they press silently these two notes around D <laughs> order to make sure they don't miss and um, that's a very interesting solution that I don't really think I would need but uh, it's just something funny I remembered and uh, anyway between this prelude and the first prelude nevertheless there is a connection and this connection might be felt if we would just compare rhythmical structures of the first prelude and the last one because uh, just look how the first one sounds <laughs> So we always feel um, ta -ta 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 -ta, um, pa -pa 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 -pa, with a syncopated second 16 note, which is um, similar to the last one. So as you see, the meaning of music is very different, but rhythmical structure is actually quite similar. And in the last prelude also, uh, Chopin syncopates the second 16 note, creating a special voice on it. So we should gently mark that note as well. And another arch, uh, very interesting arch, is between preludes two and nine, because a prelude two, as we have, um, as I already said, in my opinion, is about uh, powerless, slow dying. So it's quite depressive. It's one of the most depressive and hopeless pieces in the set. But at the end of it, we have these chords. And so on. And then, in the prelude number nine, uh, we start from them. So, in the context of prelude number two, these chords, they sound rather as a statement like yes nothing can be done but we have to accept our fate so i would assign this kind of meaning to these chords acceptance at the end of prelude and in the prelude number nine we start from that point we start from that acceptance so it starts from uh, same chords as uh, we have uh, we had in prelude number in the at the end of prelude number two but then I would 
describe it as um, yes my body is mortal but you can't kill my spirit my dignity so it's not exact exactly a positive piece but this is a piece of very high spirit in general there are very very different opinions uh, how to interpret this cycle and before my recital where um, I played them I made a couple of run through for my friends um, fellow musicians my colleagues and after the first um, after the first run through my friend told me well you know uh, I think you might use, uh, you could use a little bit less rubato. It was a bit too much for me. Uh, you, you, you have too much rubato. And I listened to my recording of that run through and uh, I didn't find that it was much, uh, it was too much, but I kind of saw his point because there were spots where I was using quite a lot of rubato. So I decided, okay, I can't say I think it's bad, but I will diminish it just, you know, being. Um, having some respect to another professional opinion. And then I had another run through just uh, two days later and I played to another friend. And uh, one of his main uh, messages, one of his main feedback messages was like, well, you know, I think you can be much more brave with time. You need more rubato. <laughs> and uh, he showed me what he meant. And uh, in my opinion, that was definitely too much. Uh, and uh, so if he would play this cycle to me i would definitely say him like well you know i think you have too much rubato <laughs> so as you see uh, every opinion is quite subjective that's why um we have um very different interpretations of the cycle and in the course i'm going to uh, i try to be as open-minded as possible although of course i have to say that we are all victims of our education of our training and um some options that i respect very much i would nevertheless uh, never uh, use but uh, i will also cover them as well so hopefully i will explain more than one way how to interpret this music but nevertheless of course uh, i will be speaking about some more or less objective topics like technique optimization uh, like um, basic stylistical advice that just makes difference between amateur and professional piano playing but everything on top of that my own um, interpretational ideas of course this is quite subjective so don't be surprised if some other musician would tell you just different things so i wish you a great learning experience and hope that you will find a lot of useful information for yourself in this course